Okay, and we are recording. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Sachi Arakawa. I am a planning consultant with the consulting firm Cascadia Partners, and we've been working with the city and county of Flagstaff on the Flagstaff Regional Plan Update, um, specifically the scenario planning work. And we've been working in the region um, on, on this project uh, since around uh, November, December of last year. Um, and that's what we are here to give you um, sort of a recap and um, update on, and we'll be sharing what we've been doing in that work and what we're planning on doing for the next year. Um, before I go any farther, I wanted to give an opportunity um, for the city and county um, to say hello and introduce themselves. Oh, and I'll also quickly say um, I'm joined today by my other two um, planning consultant colleagues, uh, Ayano Healy and Alex Steinberger, aka Steiny. Um, you two feel free to say hello in the chat, um, and you may hear from them a little later um, in the presentation. And now I'll pass it along to Sarah Dechter from the city um, to give a welcome on behalf of the city and county. Hi, everyone. Um, Sachi, you may have to start my video for me. It says I can't because the host has stopped it. Oh, interesting. OK, let me work on that. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Dechter. I'm the Comprehensive and Neighborhood Planning Manager for the City of Flagstaff. Um, with me today from the city on the webinar is Melissa Shaw, who is a Senior Planner for Long Range Planning at Coconino County, and Jordan Hollinger, who is the City of Flagstaff's Associate Planner for Comprehensive Planning. Um, and so we are very happy to welcome you today. If we could advance to the next slide. The uh, policy of the City of Flagstaff is we begin meetings with our land acknowledgement. The City of Flagstaff humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands still inhabited by native descendants border mountains sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will up forever know this place as home. <clears throat> so this project is um, the regional plan update, which is taking our regional plan 2030 and pressing us forward into the future to a future of 2045. Um, what you see on the screen now is our regional plan website, which is at flagstaff.az.gov forward slash regional plan 2045. This webinar today, is an information sharing step in this multi-phase process. So if you look at the planning and participate, public participation and plan development tab of this website, it'll take you through what all the different phases are, what the expectations are, what our promises are to the public. Um, and then there's a ton of reports and data and background information available. We'll go over some of that today um, with the presentation that Sachi, Ayano, and, and Alex are going to go over. But I wanted to make sure everybody knew that this resource is there. So if this is the first time you've attended a meeting on the regional plan, um, know this, we have been out in the community doing collaborative work um, for the last year and a half, and there's more to come. The step today is really a check-in so that everyone in the community knows how we are using the information we've gotten so far. Um, because in, our, in terms of our public participation work with planning, we like to make sure that when we come and talk with the community, that you know what we've done, that it hasn't ended up in some box in the corner under my desk. It is actively being used in the development of the regional plan. Um, and so I'm gonna hand it back to Sachi and her team to give you the rest of this update. And Melissa and Jordan and I are here to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And I put the link to the regional plan website also in the chat if you're curious to check that out if you haven't already. All right, so here's our agenda for today. I've got you here for an hour with me. 
Um, first, we've done the welcome and meeting logistics. Um, in just a moment, um, I'll give you an overview of the scenario planning process. Then we'll dive a little deeper into uh, the pieces of the scenario process planning process that we've done so far um, in this winter and spring. So the exploratory scenario planning work that we've done and the Face the Future workshops, which some of you may have already attended. Um, then we'll talk about how the feedback that we got from the public during the Face the Future workshops become the building blocks of the scenarios that we create and, and what those scenarios look like. Um, and then finally, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer. So if you do have any questions that come up um, throughout this presentation, um, you'll have an opportunity uh, to ask those. Uh, we have a Q&A panel that should be available to you um, to, to ask questions throughout, <clears throat> and we'll answer those at the end. Um, and then we'll talk about next steps and upcoming events. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the scenario planning process and what that looks like, because I know many of you may not be um, very familiar with scenario planning and are also probably curious about how it relates to the regional plan. Um, so first off, just to, you know, kind of back up and talk about the regional plan. Um, so the, the regional plan is a collaboration between the city of Flagstaff and Coconino County. It is a long range plan, which means it looks out into the future at, at a relatively long range. So typically long range plans um, will plan out anywhere from 20 to 40 years. Um, and it helps us plan for how our region grows in the future, sets goals and um, uh, you know, sort of vision and informs policy about growth. Our last regional plan was adopted in 2014, so almost 10 years ago now, and it looked out into a future to 2030, which is actually only seven years away now. So it's time for an update. Uh, why is a regional plan important? Uh, well, our region is rapidly changing. Um, we have changing water supply, suburban development happening in greenfield sites like John Wesley Powell, um, growth downtown and in the NAU campus, um, loss, of, loss of forest land and open space. Um, we know that the hospital campus uh, location is shifting. So a lot of, lot of changes and moving parts in the region. And it's important that we plan for what growth looks like in our future so that we can manage it. And so that um, the way that we grow meets the goals, values, and vision that the community has for the region of Flagstaff. Um, and so an important part of the re of a regional planning process is a future growth illustration. Um, this is kind of a hard map to see. This is from the previous regional plan, um, but it uh, what, what we're looking at here is the Flagstaff region and sort of a diagram showing how we want to grow. And of course, this, this map would take a lot of context and explaining to, to really make a lot of sense of, but what I can tell you is that it is essentially a blueprint for um, what the region, where the region wants to grow, where it does not want to grow, um, maybe where how transportation plays into that, what areas we want to preserve, um, and where we want to see jobs and housing go. Um, a future growth illustration is oftentimes created through a scenario planning process. This is because scenario planning allows us to test multiple potential future growth options. Rather than simply creating one and moving forward with it, we look at several options and allow ourselves to consider which might actually meet um, the goals and values of the region in the most successful way. Why is scenario planning uh, in that way important? Because the future is very uncertain. We know there's a lot of external factors uh, that affect our region that we cannot predict. And because of that, we need to be flexible and, and um, allow ourselves a lot of options. Um, we know that, or I should say, we don't know what population growth will look like um, 
in the next 20 years. In fact, even our own projections are not sure if we will lose population or potentially grow significantly. Those could be two very different stories um, that we would need to react to as, as a region and plan for. We also know that there's an increasingly volatile climate and that climate change continues um, to create ha natural hazards and um, extreme weather events. Um, and, and that those are becoming worse um, and maybe less predictable because of climate change issues. And so those are all unknown, you know, where, when, and to what extent those types of events are going to happen um, is also a future unknown. Um, well, there are many new technologies and trends impacting the region, um, in increase in remote work, uh, short-term rentals, autonomous vehicles, economic uncertainty. Um, so many things that we don't that we can't predict about the future, um, even though what we can predict is that there will be uncertainty. So a traditional planning approach um, takes the assumptions, sort of the goals and, and desires of the region, what we, what we think we want, and forecasts that forward into one future. So thinking about that future um, growth map that I showed, um, if we went with the tr traditional planning approach, we would have one idea of what that would look like from the beginning of this regional planning process, and we would follow that trajectory um, without testing other options. And what that does not respond to is all of the unknown external factors that could happen between now and the future. And so what scenario planning allows us to do is um, do a little more planning around those unknown external factors that could happen. Things like recession, political changes, um, emerging technology, climate change. Excuse me. These are all things that we cannot predict, but we can plan for um, and try to uh, do our best to, to look at as many options as we can and understand how those options for our future are most durable against many unknown external factors. So scenario planning allows us to test multiple futures um, uh, rather than simply forecasting for one. Um, how does scenario planning work? Um, what do the scenarios look like? Um, so scenarios for the regional plan will test various approaches to man managing the region's growth. Um, the first scenario that we create is called the business as usual scenario, also sometimes called the trend scenario because it essentially illustrates what happens if current and past trends continue and our policies do not change. Um, so this is kind of the status quo um, scenario and basically follows what's already happening in the region. Um, as a sort of uh, response to that, we create alternative scenarios that ask the question, what happens if we do things differently? Typically, we create three alternative scenarios. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four. Um, but these are uh, scenario growth scenarios that present um, an alternative to what is what the standard might be. Uh, we are lucky in this scenario planning process that uh, the city of Flagstaff and the county um, wanted to do an exploratory planning um, process, which allows us to um, really substantively involve the community in scenario planning. So this happens before this in any well before the alternative scenarios are created, um, and it's a way for the public to weigh in on what the alternative scenarios could look like. It actually allows them to essentially create the building blocks for those alternative scenarios. Um, in order to do this exploratory scenario planning process, we. Um, uh, held a series of public workshops um, and we created a game called Face the Future Flagstaff, which allows people to imagine what growth might look like given uh, a series of sort of uncertainties, um, uncertain future conditions. And um, Ayano is going to talk more to us about um, what this game looked like and what the what workshops looked like and some of the outcomes. But I just wanted to underscore that um, this public process is at the core of the work that we're doing. 
So from that public workshop, um, the Face the Future workshops, we got a series of ideas about how the region could grow. We call these growth ideas. Um, and we generated, uh, the public generated six of them through the uh, Face the Future workshop exploratory process. Those growth ideas um, can on their own become a scenario theme or they can be packaged together, in two or three growth ideas to create a scenario theme, which is essentially sort of the um, blueprint for the what becomes the final alternative scenario. And we have, in our case for Flagstaff, we'll likely have three alternative scenarios. Um, so the growth ideas are um, the build, you know, sort of the beginning, they get packaged into themes and then the themes are what inform the creation of the alternative scenarios. Um, I will also say here that the growth ideas that were created um, have uh, will have and will be vetted um, by city and county staff, as well as our technical advisory group. Um, so they're weighing in as well on um, this process and, and helping us refine these growth ideas that are the building blocks of, of the scenarios. Okay. So once we have the uh, sort of building blocks and the blueprint for the scenario, um, the scenario actually gets created in a software called Urban Footprint. Um, it's a scenario planning software that's map based and it allows us to model different growth patterns. Um, so Urban Footprint is really cool because it's we, what we call a sketch planning tool and it allows us to kind of test these growth ideas that the public has generated and that we've refined um, and actually kind of paint them on a map of the region. Um, what that allows us to do and the reason it's actually a modeling, you know, qualitative, excuse me, quantitative process is because the modeling software then um, creates a series of performance metrics that we can evaluate the scenarios on, um, including things like um, in this scenario, how much are people driving? What are the greenhouse gas emission impacts? Um, what are the water and energy use impacts? Um, what will our tax base look like? And what will our tax revenue um, be? So we can really uh, test each one of the scenarios um, and create a report card to see how well the scenario um, sort of uh, holds up to the goals and values that are, have been stated um, for the region. Um, so I wanted to, again, just mention the sort of how we start, where we start from with scenarios is a, a baseline scenario called business as usual. Um, and so this is something we model. This does not come from growth ideas from the public. This is something that is actually modeled based on current trends. Um, and so we've done this, we've already modeled this scenario, um, and it will be used as sort of a um, foil to the alternative scenarios that we create. Um, and what the business as usual scenario looks like for Flagstaff, um, so this is what our future would look like um, if nothing changed, is that the region barely has enough developable land with adequate infrastructure to accommodate even a modest population and job growth. Uh, additionally, housing becomes more expensive and the, re the region is able to house less of its workforce locally. So folks that work in Flagstaff can't necessarily afford to live here. Um, households drive about as much as they do today. So driving does not go down. Um, and due to larger population, actually traffic on regional, and regional roads does increase. Um, also, development continues to occur in areas where post-fire flood hazards exist, and so, you know, flooding is, continues to be an issue and a risk. So that's what business as usual looks like. It sounds a little grim, but I mean, this is something we see in regions all over the country that we work in, um, right? It's not a surprise that um, the way things are going today, if we don't make changes, um, we, we won't see the outcomes we want. And, um, you know, we may see a, a lot of sort of negative outcomes as well. And that's why it's important to have alternative scenarios and think about how we want to change um, and what we want that change to look like. 
So alternative scenarios ask the question, what happens if we do things differently from business as usual? What if we grow in a different way? Alternative scenarios are created again through a public feedback process um, and vetted by the city and the county staff and a technical advisory committee. Um, in the fall, after this alternative scenarios have been developed, uh, the public will get to evaluate and compare the scenarios. Um, remember, we have these metrics that we can, basically we have a report card that we can create for each one of these scenarios to tell us um, how it performs and understand how that performance um, matches the goals and values that we have. Um, ultimately, the goal of the workshops in the fall is to choose a preferred scenario um, and, you know, decide which of these scenarios is the best fit um, with what the region wants to see. And the preferred scenario eventually will inform the future growth map, um, as well as policies that are set by the regional plan. <clears throat> So here's a few examples of how scenario planning um, or some scenarios that have been developed in a scenario planning process um, for other cities. We have um, Nashville next. Uh, so that's Nashville's regional plan, or actually I think that might be their comprehensive plan for the city. Um, and that is in the top strip there. They had uh, two, one uh, business as usual scenario and two uh, alternative scenarios. And below that is scenarios from uh, Portland, Oregon, their comprehensive plan, which is a plan for the entire city. Um, Portland called their business as usual scenario the default. Um, they had three alternative scenarios um, looking at different growth patterns, including a pattern where they focused on neighborhood centers, um, a growth pattern where they uh, focused on corridors, so developing along major arterial roads, um, and a scenario where uh, they focused on the central city and really built out downtown. So these are just a few examples of what some alternative scenarios in other cities have looked like. And again, you know, this was before they finally chose their preferred scenario. Um, so this is the timeline for our project. Um, we right now are have completed the exploratory process and Ayano again will explain a little bit more about um, how that process went in just a moment. Um, so in the exploratory process we generated growth ideas and those growth ideas now in our current uh, phase of work which is creating scenario themes um, the growth ideas get packaged into scenario themes um, that describe different ways that we could grow um, in the future. So that's where we're at now. Um, once the scenario themes are created, vetted, um, you know, uh, multiple groups, stakeholders, staff have had a chance to look at them, make sure they're feasible and make sense. Um, then we go into the modeling process. Um, so the scenario themes are then used as the blueprint to um, model using urban footprint, the scenario planning tool. Um, and this tells us how well each scenario addresses um, future unknowns and our community goals. Um, and we, we get report cards for each one of our scenarios. Um, so we present those scenarios and their report cards in a scenario choosing process that is the next phase. Um, the public is invited to a series of workshops, focus groups, open houses, um, where we will ask people to select their preferred scenario and give us feedback on the scenarios. Um, this preferred scenario will help guide uh, the discussions about the future land use map and help set goals for the regional plan. 
Um, kind of in tandem to uh, this process, we are also having um, collaborative discussions with community members and stakeholders about policy um, for the regional plan and what that should look like, because we think it's really important that the policy that we put forward in the regional plan is feasible, implementable, and actually responds to community needs and values. And we know those needs and values are very diverse. Um, there's many different types of stakeholders in the city that want different things. And so we want to make sure that we do a really robust job of having conversations with people about what that policy should look like so that it can actually be effective and implementable and um, have an impact. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it along to my colleague Ayana Healy, who's going to tell us a bit more about this exploratory scenario planning process. Great. Thanks, Sachi. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm going to go over kind of what we did this earlier this spring uh, with these workshops uh, with the public and different stakeholders. And uh, just to give you a snapshot of the type of um, activities we did and how that feeds into the next part of the process. So you can go ahead and move to the next slide. So to pull the thread through what Sachi was saying, you know, there's there's numerous external factors that are out of our control. But in order to um, you know, develop alternative scenarios that you know, have a chance at being resilient and, and being able to be dynamic and um, how Flagstaff can grow in the future, we must you know, incorporate that into our process. So the three external factors that we felt were most salient and got guidance from our TAG members and other stakeholders you know, you know, were coupled around kind of future funding population change and climate impacts. All of these things could have, uh, you know, we could have lots of funding, you know, or little funding or same as usual, population change could go up and down and that would impact kind of the need for housing and jobs and also climate change impacts. We don't know to what degree and extent those are going to, you know, have an impact on the region in the future. So we took those most, you know, pressing relevant uh, external factors and, you know, characterize them as challenges. These are and created challenge cards as part of a game that we then uh, developed. So you can go to the next slide. And so these three challenges we had were really the anchor to the game that we created called Face the Future Flagstaff. Um, and yes, alliteration is maybe something we're, fa we're fans of. Um, but anyway, so we you know, used, um, developed a game where we asked the public to basically get a random assortment of funding, population change, and climate impacts, uh, you know, set in front of them and try to answer the question, given these, uh, this random assortment of external factors, how should Flagstaff grow in the future? Where should new jobs and housing um, be placed? and where, and what are some of the things that we must consider related to budget and transportation and connectivity. So all to say that this is really complex and complicated stuff, but it was extremely impressive to see um, many members of the public, maybe some of you on this call, rise to the occasion and participate in the workshops we had earlier this spring. So you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so how did it go? So just a quick synopsis, we had a lot of the workshops we hosted in the spring were at the Aquaplex. Folks came in and circled around a table of small groups between four and eight people. Um, participants got an overview of kind of the purpose and goals and objectives of the game, how to play the game, and how this feedback was going to be used in the next phase. And then we uh, hit the ground running for the next 60 minutes to have participants kind of place tokens for housing and jobs. Um, on the map of, of the Flagstaff region for where they think, um, you know, growth should happen. Um, also, part of that too is identifying areas where we don't want growth to happen and, and things that we should consider when we want to preserve in preserving natural areas and conservation, things like that. Um, so after going through the game in small groups, each session usually ended with kind of a large group report back, everyone sharing kind of what they, what they um, you know, implemented as far as strategies for their way of putting their tokens on the map. And, and we 
took all of that and um, incorporated it into um, kind of these growth ideas, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, yeah, and so who did we talk to? Um, can go to the next slide to just kind of show the snapshot of that. Um, so in just three weeks, we reached almost 300 uh, residents in Flagstaff uh, through across 13 different workshops, generating 60 maps, um, you know, for, you know, gameplay that like every single one of these maps had tokens on where jobs and housing should go. So we took all of that feedback and we, you know, both the discussion uh, and, and notes and considerations and, and good ideas that we heard and we transcribed and consolidated those. And you can move to the next slide, Sachi. Um, we took those notes from the discussion and transcribed and coded those. That was a, a big lift by the city in doing taking all that thoughtful information into uh, and digitizing that. We, we took um, also all of the map-based data where all the tokens were placed on the map and digitized that into seeing kind of where were the concentrations of different types of housing and employment jobs, things like that. Um, so we took those things together, did some analysis and, and basically um, arrived at a few, you know, a handful of like major themes that popped up. So on the next slide, um, that kind of highlights the major themes that we heard. And they related to growth, transportation, and land protection. So as far as growth, there was general support for mixed use development. Uh, people were placing tokens for housing and jobs close together, talking about how um, there could be a lot of benefits with that. Um, and a big emphasis on um, bringing more amenities and services across all neighborhoods and activity centers. Um, but that part of the discussion also in, in, um, you know, was cautioned with, you know, managing density. We don't want to have like big towers in Flagstaff. We want to manage um, how, how tall we build because we need to, you know, think about kind of the beautiful scenery and other types of elements that are around us. The next big theme that we heard after summarizing all of this uh, workshop data and input was about transportation. Um, that's a big issue. And there's uh, you know, lots of good comments we heard about that, but overall there was general support and a desire for more connectivity and roads across Flagstaff. I'm sure you all know some bottlenecks or have some in mind uh, that would be correspond with the feedback we heard. The last thing that was very apparent from the feedback we heard um, through, or what was collected through the Face the Future maps was about land protection. And that uh, the state and federal forest area and open space is a coveted resource and what makes Flagstaff attractive. So it was of utmost importance that, you know, scenarios that are developed as a result of this workshop feedback, you know, help elevate and prioritize conservation and protecting natural resources. Um, I'll just say also that, you know, some of the um, benefits of doing workshops like in this format and asking for people's um, input through maybe a more novel way like playing a game is that it helped really spur more creativity and discussion and insights that um, that maybe might not have occurred if you just asked a simple question, you know, how should how should Flagstaff grow in the re in the future. Um, so that was a, a great benefit. We, we heard a lot of um, good insights from members of the public. Um, we also were able to engage um, different uh, sector or sections of the public, like youth. Uh, we had numerous workshops with uh, uh, high school students and they, they were able to bring in um, interesting and helpful perspectives as far as how things, how the region should grow in the future. Um, Similarly, uh, there was one workshop that was conducted exclusively or primarily in Spanish with English interpretation uh, supplied for the couple of people who were only able to speak English. And that was, I think, um, a big win for as far as reaching uh, communities that aren't traditionally or historically um, included in an in a, um, effort like this. So there was a lot of good data that came from those workshops as well. Um, so yeah, so we have all of this input, um, and just like Sachi said, 
the data and the information that we collected from these workshops were um, what these growth ideas were derived from. So in this specific process, we kind of arrived at six different growth ideas that uh, felt most compelling and interesting to test out based on what was um, prioritized by the public. And it's these growth ideas that are going to be kind of combined and assorted across to develop uh, scenario themes from here. So that's in a nutshell, and I'll pass it back to Sachi to continue kind of what the building blocks for scenarios look like. Thanks, Sayano. Um, yeah, so as you can see, um, we got a lot of information from these workshops and really rolled up our sleeves with uh, members of the Flagstaff community and um, actually created some growth ideas that will become uh, the alternative scenarios that we create. So let's talk a little bit more about how these growth, what these growth ideas are, first off, and how they will become um, or how they are the building blocks of scenarios. Um, alongside the growth ideas, we also have growth principles, um, which I'll talk a bit more about as well. So these are the six growth ideas that came out of our Face the Future workshops. Uh, again, these are just draft ideas right now. Um, we're also workshopping these with our technical advisory group, with city and county staff to make sure they're feasible, that they make sense, that they match local um, understanding um, and you know, on the ground knowledge. Um, but let me just read these to you so we can give you a sense of, of what these are. And I'll also note um, that we have a survey available on the Flagstaff uh, Regional Plan website if you'd like to give feedback on any of these growth ideas. Um, so the first growth idea is regional, or I'm sorry, rural activity centers, um, sometimes called outfill. So this is uh, a growth idea where more housing and jobs would happen in Belmont, Dhoni Park, Kachina Village, Mountaineer, Winona, um, and having better transportation links between those more rural, um, small communities. Uh, growth idea number two is to urbanize Flagstaff's greenfield sites. When I say greenfield sites, I mean areas that are not currently developed, that do not have um, building on them. So this would be areas like John Wesley Powell and the new hospital site. Um, so developing those to become more, more relatively dense, um, you know, probably not quite as dense as somewhere like downtown, um, but much denser than they are now. Um, you know, more like kind of mixed use regional activity centers. Um, so building into some of our areas within the city um, that are not developed yet. Idea number three is to focus on downtown and NAU. Um, so focusing a little more on areas that are already developed. Um, so downtown and adjacent areas like the old hospital site um, would see more redevelopment. So development on top of places that are already developed, um, but nothing taller than about six stories because we heard, uh, uh, you know, time and time again, how important the views downtown are. Um, the idea would be to minimize loss of historic buildings and neighborhood character, but maximize workforce and affordable housing. Um, our fourth idea is to focus on East Flagstaff. So still kind of focusing more within the city, not in more rural areas um, and focusing more on areas that are, are currently mostly developed, um, but creating mixed use development, especially along the fourth street corridor, um, more employment along route 66, like retail, government, maybe tech, um, and improving the mix and variety of uses of housing on the east side of Flagstaff. Idea number five is to prioritize conservation and avoid hazards. Um, so this is a growth idea that focuses on preserving natural areas with high ecological values, reducing expansion into the urban, into the wildland urban interface. Idea, idea number six is to attract large employers. Um, so this growth idea um, would uh, focus growth around attracting larger employers to the region as a way to diversify the economy and keep workers local. So those are the six growth ideas that were identified in the Face of Future Flagstaff workshops. 
Um, while the workshops were happening kind of concurrently, um, our team with the city and county were working on something, a, a set of slightly different components of the scenarios called growth principles. Um, so growth principles are kind of higher level um, concepts that come from our regional plan. Uh, sorry, let me pull this up so that I, um, so growth, growth principles are higher level concepts that come from our regional plan and our uh, visioning workshops that were done in the fall. Um, we pulled about 23 of these growth principles from uh, pr the previous planning efforts. And we actually asked uh, the public uh, to prioritize the growth principles for us. So again, these are, these are principles that are a little higher level, but that tell us, um, that inform uh, how growth might happen. Um, so we had a survey uh, open for about five weeks from May 2nd to June 2nd. We had over 300 respondents, so quite a few people participating. Um, and the five growth principles that um, were identified as highest priority were the following. Um, preserving natural areas with high ecological value, minimizing water use and planning for water conservation, mitigating traffic congestion, maximizing the availability of affordable and workforce housing. So housing where people working in the city or region could afford um, and limiting the expansion of the wildland urban interface. So these were the growth principles that kind of, um, you know, percolated to the top as being um, particularly essential and important. But as I said, we identified 23 growth principles in total in past planning efforts, and we'll continue to kind of bring those into uh, the scenario uh, the, as we're baking these scenarios, um, it will be an ingredient um, in that process. Okay, so how do growth ideas and growth principles actually, how are they the building blocks of scenarios? How, how do they lead to a scenario? So again, the growth ideas which were generated in the Face the Future workshops are specific concepts for where future growth would occur. And these are, these are ideas that could really almost be kind of sketched on a map. You know, they're relatively concrete um, ideas about where growth should happen. Growth principles come from our regional planning objectives um, and they're more general values and visions that are carried forward from that work um, that inform how growth should happen. So these two components come together to form scenario themes. Scenario themes are draft versions of the scenario, again, a sort of blueprint that describe a concept for future growth um, that are informed by these growth ideas and growth principles. The scenario theme then actually gets put into the scenario modeling software and becomes a scenario, so an alternative scenario. Um, in its final version, a scenario depicts a refined concept for growth that is an alternative to the business as usual. Um, so a scenario is presented through three key components, a narrative, so a story, a map, and performance metrics that tell us uh, how the scenario performs, um, you know, looking at all of our goals and priorities for the region. So that hopefully is kind of a good overview of how a scenario is created and um, how the public um, is able to weigh in in that process and, and how that's happened so far. Um, once again, this is the um, timeline for our project. We've wrapped up the exploratory process. We are currently creating scenario themes, which will be the blueprints for the scenario, the alternative scenarios that will be modeled in Urban Footprint. Once those alternative scenarios are created, we'll come back to the public um, and ask the public to help us uh, choose a preferred scenario, which will then inform the future growth map um, and future land use map. Uh, as well as regional goals and policies. So next steps, um, at least in the short term, are that we do have an open house coming up. It's in person in Flagstaff at City Hall. 
Um, it'll be Monday, June 26th. It's in the evening from 6 to 7 p.m. And City and County staff will be there, be available to answer questions. They'll have some materials to present, um, kind of similar to what we have today. Um, definitely some materials from the Face the Future workshop feedback um, and lots more that you can um, find out about the regional plan and the scenario planning process. So put that on your calendar if you're interested. Um, please uh, visit the regional plan website for more information if you're interested in um, following the project, if you want to get updates on our work. Um, it's a great resource. And then, sorry, I was pull, trying to pull this up earlier. Let me also put this in the chat. Um, we also have a survey uh, that we've created for you to give feedback on some of the information that was shared here today, um, in particular, the growth ideas that we shared. We'd love to hear your feedback on those. Um, and uh, I think there's some uh, an, another question or two um, that you can give feedback on about the, the content of this webinar as well in that survey. Um, so I just put the link in the chat. The link is also up on the slides here for those of you following along on the recording at home. Um, we have a QR code here that I've pasted in. I haven't tested it myself. Hopefully it works. I'm not always the most tech savvy with these QR codes, but that is another option as well. Um, yes, yeah, Sarah just noted in the chat that um, if you did come to the webinar on behalf of a community partner organization, um, please fill out the survey so that we know you have attended. And thank you to all our community partners who have been involved um, so far in this process. Oops, let me go back here. Um, we'll, we'll have um, so an opportunity to answer questions if you have them in just a moment, um, but I wanted to give uh, Sarah, a, a chance, and Melissa, if you'd like as well, um, to uh, say any last words before we open up for Q&A. Thank you very much, Sachi. I hope I can see we have about 35 live participants today. Um, and this, as Sachi said, is going to go on the project website with this same feedback form so that people who want to watch it between now and July 15th. Um, can do so and can continue to provide us feedback on this step. Um, we really do want you to fill out the survey so we know how we're doing um, feedback, not only on the content we're working on, but on how the process is working for the community is very important to Melissa and I and helps us stay um, nimble and make sure we're meeting everyone's needs as best we can. So um, I can't emphasize enough how important the survey is. And thank you very much for um, coming today. And now to questions. Okay, I don't see any questions in the Q&A panel. So I'll maybe... Uh, Give a little bit of space, maybe another 15 seconds or so to see if there's any last questions. My Flagstaff community is always has so many questions and usually is very active. So I'm surprised you're all maybe a little sleepy after lunch. <laughs> or maybe we did a good job of presenting all the information. So <laughs> it's always a lot of information. Um, it's a lot to, yeah, it's a lot to absorb too. So um, well, to, to mention will... while we're filling time mm -hmm. and letting people think of their questions, reminding them that the Q&A button is at the bottom, um, and you don't have to turn the slide back on, we're good. Um, the staff from the city and county are also making what we call, what I like to call the tour day commissions. Um, and so we are presenting to so far 10 and maybe more of the city and county boards and commissions this summer. So if there's a particular topic that you would like to dive into more depth with us, feel free to contact me or Jordan Hollander or Melissa, um, and we can pull up the schedule and tell you when we're, when we're scheduled to go have a talk like this with um, sustainability or parks and recreation or whatever the topic closest to your heart is. Um, and uh, please, so please check that out. I think Jordan intends to put it on the website. It's just not up today. 
Thanks, Sarah. And I see we have a comment in the chat. Um, it would be good to say that the six growth growth ideas can be mutually exclusive. So that's a really good point. And I, yeah, I think um, the growth ideas could stand on their own. Um, you know, any of those six growth ideas could be their own scenario. And some of the growth ideas definitely might not pair well together. But um, some of the growth uh, ideas definitely do pair well together and most likely will be paired to create a scenario theme. So, we, and again, the scenario themes are just blueprints for the actual scenario. So sort of almost a draft scenario. Um, so yes, uh, the uh, six growth ideas can be paired and, and you know, work together uh, in some way, uh, not necessarily all six of them, maybe two or three, uh, but they also can, you know, kind of oppose each other or be different. And part of the really cool thing about scenarios is we can test things that maybe, you know, growth ideas or growth scenarios that are not, you know, do not agree with one another or maybe represent very different um, ideological ideas about how to grow and test them and, you know, kind of see what some of what the report cards look like and if they um, are actually uh, meeting the goals that we want them to meet and um, uh, uh, sort of pr producing the results that we would like them to pr produce. And I saw one other question about um, uh, the link to the webinar, and it looks like Sarah has shared that link. Um, we will also be sending, Sarah will also be sending out the link um, to the webinar recording um, and the survey in the newsletter, the e-newsletter. Hey, okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions and we are just before the hour here. So I think we can all um, leave a little bit early. Thank you so much everyone for joining us on behalf of myself, the Cascadia team, and of course the city and county. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of this process. We're really looking forward to hearing from all of you throughout the process, throughout the summer. Um, and into the fall when we do scenario choosing. Um, so we will we will be seeing much more of each other, I hope. Take care and have a great afternoon.